The Mask's Complicated Ultraviolent Origin Story, explored in detail. Exactly 27 years ago, Jim Carrey consolidated his status as the king of comedy by playing the titular role in Chuck Russell's 1994 superhero comedy flick, The Mask. And while it's no surprise that the movie was based on The Mask comic book, a series published by Dark Horse Comics, it is insane how mean-spirited the comic version actually is. In fact, calling this comic series mean-spirited would be a gross understatement. Published in 1991 as a limited series, the comic books were highly disturbing, intense, gritty, violent, and gory enough to make people feel queasy. Safe to say that it was both dumbfounding and a little uncomfortable, especially since it had scenes like a guy's cutting his cheek, as well as someone carving a smiley face onto his own hand with his nails and so forth. Full credits go to the effective, detailed drawing, which makes it all more intense. Yeah. Freeze! Speaking of both the movie and the comics, specifically in terms of mood and tone, they are apparently different, yet related, under the same name. The film was about a hapless guy acquiring superpowers that save the day, but that's not how the comic books roll. Agreed that it begins just like the movie. We have the character of Stanley Ipkiss, who is literally treated like everyone's punching bag. But as for the similarities, that's about it. The story takes a total 180 flip once he finds the mask. Moreover, how he finds it is quite different from what is shown in the movie. The comic book narrates Ipkiss getting a present for his girlfriend Kathy from an antique store where he purchases an old jade mask, which he tries on for fun. Just like the movie, he turns into the green-faced lunatic with nearly limitless power, operating mostly on cartoon logic, and always boasting a toothy grin. The Ipkiss in the movie is a hopeless romantic, wanting to be the cool guy, one who even says he might become a superhero and actually ends up saving the day. Whereas the Ipkiss in the comic book is a psychotic maniac who goes on a killing spree, not to simply exact revenge on those who he dislikes, but just about anyone. Right from suffocating a teacher to butchering total strangers, and let's not forget slaughtering cops who are just doing their jobs. The comic version is categorically crazy. Thus, in today's video, we are going to shed some light on the complicated, ultra-violent origin story of The Mask in depth. So, you better be smoking. Are you ready for it? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Where did the mask come from? The origins explored. You will be surprised to know that in the original comics, the mask was actually mysteriously created in the past at an unknown time and by an unidentifiable tribe that originated in Africa. The shamans of the tribe used primordial African practices ingrained in their superstitious spiritual knowledge while creating the mask as per ancient rituals. The bearer of the mask was automatically fused with a fictional magical reality along with physical impermeability and numerous skills which bore resemblance to that of a cartoon character. The entity could stretch one's body way beyond regular human parameters and pull unexpected objects out of thin air. What a rush. Now, going back to the movie, the mask is deduced to be a creation of Loki, the Norse god of fire and mischief. So, it would be wrong to say that the mask was created sometime between the end of the 14th century AD and the starting of the 5th century AD. According to some very old writings, Loki has been depicted as a night god and a nocturnal being, which makes all the more sense why the mask operates the way it does. After all, the power of the mask is only active during the night. It is also believed that the minute the user dons the mask, the person turns into Loki himself. As intriguing as this may sound, 
This theory is not without its contradictions. Every transformation of the mask is as unique as the person who wears it, and like it or not, they are always inclined towards following their own personal desires, way more than that of Loki. Having said that, there are plenty of other interpretations available when it comes to the origin of the mask. There is one that states that it was Loki who had created the mask and injected it with some of his very own powers. Then, he threw it on Earth purposely to spread confusion, disorder, and terror among us humans. And while this is the theory of the origin of the mask shown in the second film, it raises its own set of questions. The main one being, why would Loki grant powers to a meager mortal, elevating his status to be his equal, or to other gods? Isn't it a given that the one who wears the mask is quite capable of doing a lot more than Loki usually does? You might want to agree with us on this. There's rarely any mention of Loki being able to do any of these things, like conjure something out of nothing, the ability to deform, manipulate, or warp reality to his will. Well, if he had possession of such powers in the first place, maybe his adoptive father Odin would not have been able to banish him from Asgard to Earth as a punishment for his past actions. Therefore, there isn't really a fitting rock-hard theory behind the creation of the mask, and it is still widely under debate. Many of you might not know this, but according to a deleted scene in the 1994 film, it was a group of Vikings in the 10th century who had chanced upon it. Later, they traveled to a place that they believe was the end of the world. This is later shown as Edge City. The Vikings placed the mask inside an iron chest, naming it the Curse of Loki, whom they absolutely loathed. Next, they bury it, and a witch is seen praying to heaven to help the poor fool that finds it in the future. No points for guessing who that fool is. Let's turn now to the animated series, which also premiered in 1994. The mask is considered to have been fashioned around the 11th century in the Nordic lands of Europe, but its maker remains a mystery to this date. Then again, we find out that this was just false information propagated by the primary and recurring antagonist of the series, Dr. Septimus Pretorius, in Season 1, Episode 5, titled Sister Mask, as a means to trap Stanley Itkiss and use it for himself. In the following episode, entitled Shadow of a Skillet, a mysterious imp Skillet, who was over 4,000 years old, has known every individual to wear the mask. In fact, it was Skillet who stated that the first and oldest to don the mask was the ancient king of the Huns, Attila the Hun, also known as the God's Plague or Scourge of God. He ruled from 434 AD until his death at around 453 AD, and there's a very high possibility that the mask was created somewhat after the 5th century AD. This also establishes Loki's connection to the origin of the mask. How does the mask alter its wearer's mind, anatomy, and persona? The most intriguing characteristic of the mask is what it does to the mind and personality of its users, when they happen to be under its influence. The solitary fact that it is magical in nature alters anyone who uses it, as ruled by the inner desires of their subconscious minds. The mask changes the bearer into his alter ego, founded on the most craved yet bottled up personality. Next, it amplifies those emotions and keeps the alter ego in charge of making the decisions with absolutely no self-restraint or possible psychological reservations thrust upon him by himself or society. Of course, this would vary from one person to the other and the user's mental and spiritual orientation at that moment. Mind you, the mask also feeds on the darker instincts prevailing in a user's psyche, and with that, we are hinting at elements like rage, greed, envy, mischief, immaturity, and lust, among various other negative emotions. From the, real door. the forces behind the mask are not only irrational, but also beyond human understanding. 
It all depends on his or her personality, and the mask brings out the inner self accordingly. Making use of the user's imagination, the mask would satisfy its unquenchable thirst for violence and destruction. It goes without saying that the mask is extremely temperamental, simply loves to stir up its surroundings, and wants to be the center of attention at all times. Somebody stop me! In the case of the comics, the mask not only blesses its users with soaring intellect, along with a diverse array of talents, but it also gradually transforms the user into a loon. The more time that the user spends wearing the mask, the more it ends up deeming him dangerous and cruel with rather violent tendencies. Unlike the movies, or even the animated series for that matter, it doesn't exactly replace the user's personality with another. Instead, it exaggerates the already present personality traits, unleashing unthinkable amounts of brutality. In the beginning, the user looks at this as a boon, taking advantage of the powers that the mask grants. For instance, seeking revenge against any kind of injustice that the user might have suffered previously, both personally and publicly. However, the user eventually tends to lose control and ends up becoming trapped in the mask's personality. No wonder they were always overwhelmed after they removed it. Whether they like it or not, the mask leaves behind a residual effect, making its users relive their actions and consequences. In the case of the movies, the mask acts more like a kind of addictive drug. Once the user puts it on, he or she is free to do anything under the sun without something holding him or her back, and woke up the next day with no recollection of what they have done. Okay, maybe just a few blurry memories here and there, but nothing vivid. In the first film, when Ipkiss came back to his normal self the first few times, he didn't really remember much. In fact, he even thought he had just dreamt it all. But if the user, after wearing the mask for some time, decides to remove it, and eventually they always do, then he or she is in due course of time and always remembers all the things they did while under the influence of the mask. Nevertheless, the users always seem to have this urge to want to wear the mask again. Hello, Sherry. Speaking of the mask, as displayed in the animated series, it is undeniably the most powerful version. It is able to free the user's suppressed side, but in the form of a crazed alter ego, blessing the user with powers that can literally challenge reality itself. The fact that it can be used both during the day and night gives this version quite an edge over the films. There are times when the alter ego created by the powerful mask refers to oneself in the third person, which makes it look like an independent entity. In the 15th episode, entitled Split Personality, the mask gets broken in half, and when Ipkiss uses one of the halves, that particular side of him changes into the mask. It might sound absurd, but it is what it is. The mask in the animated series also affects the wishes of the user. For example, in the final episode of the animated series, entitled The Ace Man Cometh, Ipkiss's dog gets kidnapped by Pretorius. As Ipkiss searches for Milo, he chances upon an advertisement for a limbo tournament at the Coco Bongo Club. Ipkiss knows that if he puts on the mask, he will end up going to the party instead of looking for his dog. This just shows how the mask has its own separate agenda, even without the user putting it on. You can't find me if you're locked in a truck. Huh? <laughs> Future of the Mask Franchise while well, the success of the 1994 movie helped launch Jim Carrey into superstardom and also spawned a cartoon series along with a video game for the Super Nintendo, the flick standalone sequel, The Son of the Mask, released back in 2005, failed to reach anywhere near its predecessor's level of success. And no wonder, the movie's franchise was curtly stalled. However, while celebrating the 25th anniversary of the first film and the launch of the new Mask comic, Mike Richardson, the founder of Dark Horse Comics and creator of The Mask, came up with the idea of reviving The Mask movie franchise. And here's the twist. He wants a woman lead. Yes, you heard that right. During his interview with Forbes, Richardson said that he wanted a remarkable comedian. He left out the tiny yet crucial detail of who the lead would be. While there are many choices to pick from, like 
Kristen Wiig or even Melissa McCarthy, both of whom can effortlessly portray such a wacky and physical comic role, it's hard to single out just one name given the potential talent all around the world. Without a shadow of a doubt, Richardson is also quite engrossed in the upcoming comic revival of The Mask. He has promised fans of the franchise that the new comic series will continue to play along the more darker tones of the original series. But whether or not the comic series will serve as a source of the new film is not clear at this time. We can only keep our fingers crossed, hoping that a reboot is made soon to uphold the film's legacy. Also, the standards set by Jim Carrey have left behind the next lead with the enormous task of filling his shoes. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.